Hello, 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 and welcome to IE Style Live 2021. Right from your own personal refuge, AKA the couch, the bed, the hot press, wherever you find yourself. I'm Sonia Lennon, your host for this evening, and yet again, we are joining you in your own homes. I know you all remember the tingling excitement in 2019 at Cork City Hall, where Brendan and I brought you catwalk fashion, beauty and conversation with our fireside chat with Louise O'Neill. Last year, we came to you right there in your living rooms with IE Style Live from the couch and our very special guest, Samantha Barry, Editor-in-Chief of Glamour magazine. We want nothing more than to be back in 2022 with another amazing catwalk show and face-to-face -face experience. And that is our plan, so stay close. Over the next hour, we have fashion for a new way of working with Anne-Marie O'Connor, top pro tips for having the best glowiest skin for the human that you are at any age, and an interview with the woman who has sold over 25 million books and has Nicole Kidman on speed dial, the inspirational Cecilia Hearn. Okay, this is IE Style Live, and that means that for the next hour, we are in it together. You can see me, but I also want to see you. I want to see all that you're doing to enjoy this year's IE Style Live from the couch. I want to know where you are, what you're wearing, who you're with, what you're drinking. I want all the details. So post your fabulosity with the hashtag IE Style Live 21 on Twitter at Irish Examiner. We have fantastic prize to give away for the best tweet of 250 euro shopping spree courtesy of Mahan Point Shopping Centre. Now you know you can do damage with that 250 euro. We'll be announcing the winner on Twitter later tonight. Now, to help us get in the mood, Irish Examiner drinks writer Leslie Williams is going to show us how to make the IE Style Live cocktail, a classic and elegant French 75, just like you, Leslie. We've emailed you all the ingredients, so relax and have a drink with us. Leslie, this one is right up my dark boulevard. Over to you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Glass House in the Montanati Hotel. My name is Leslie Williams. I'm the drinks writer with the Irish Examiner, and we're going to make a cocktail, and it's going to be a good one. So, four ingredients, very simple, some of which you have already in the house. Lemon juice, sugar and water, gin, and champagne. Yes, it needs to be champagne. Well, it can be cava, you know, but I'll get to that in a second. Before you do anything though with a cocktail, you make your garnish. And the first thing we're gonna do is make our lemon twist. So just take a lemon and uh, sort of cut in. You want a reasonably thick slice. Don't worry if you've gone into the pith because we're gonna remove the pith. It's that white stuff, you wanna get that out. It's a little bitter. You want the lemon oil. So you need a, a sort of bendy knife if you have, like I have here, that can cut right into the into the, into the lemon and uh, you want to then just sort of cut a couple of angles in it so it looks somewhat pretty. And then we stick that into our coupe glass. I'm going with a coupe glass. You could use a Tom Collins glass. Um, this drink is actually not unlike a Tom Collins, but it uses champagne. Um, or you could use a, a flute, but I think a coupe uh, has a certain elegance about it. Okay, so first ingredient is uh, lemon juice. Now, you need 25 grams of lemon juice, and 25 grams is more or less exactly what you get in a half a lemon. So no need, no need to measure that out. I'm just gonna squeeze that straight in. Next thing you need is sugar syrup. Sugar syrup is literally equal quantities of sugar and water by weight melted. Keeps for months. You definitely need some in your house because emergency cocktails are very important. You never know when you're gonna to need to make a an Old Fashioned, uh, or a Tom Collins, or indeed a French 75. Now, the reason it's called the French 75 is because it packs a punch. A punch not unlike the same punch you would get if you were hit or standing nearby a shell from a 75 millimeter howitzer field gun, which is what the French used in the First World War. And the French 75 is, uh, is where it gets its name from, the French 75 millimeter howitzer gun. This is 57% uh, Navy strength, Bertha's Revenge Gin, one of my absolute favorite gins. Uh, relatively new on the market. Bertha's Revenge regular gin is pretty good too at 42, uh, equally good. If it's just, I want, to, I want this cocktail to pack a punch. You could absolutely also use uh, any standard 32%. Uh, we're in the Montanati Hotel, so I could have used the Montanati Hotel's um, own gin made by Blackwater, that's 33%. Uh, Blackwater's gin itself is excellent from there, just on the North Cork border. Use gunpowder, use whatever you have at home. Okay, so. We need double the quantities of uh, gin to uh, say lemon juice, and that's about 50. 
you're using the lower strength gin, you could add a little bit extra because you do want this to be relatively punchy. Now, I've said champagne, you can absolutely use cava. Um, I got these two from O'Brien's, they very kindly donated them to me. Um, this, however, is an excellent champagne at 33 euros, so not that much more than a, the price for a decent cava. Um, I really like it, small cooperative in champagne, um, and it's kind of my house champagne, it's kind of their house champagne. But uh, let's get to that in a second. First thing we need to do is uh, shake this up. I'm just gonna throw some ice cubes in here in my cocktail shaker. Let's just move that there. Now, that should be enough. This can be a little stiff. Now, we need to just strain this into our coop. I've gone with a coop because I just think it looks prettier. And we just want to top this up with champagne. It's as simple as that. Try and Make sure you've left enough to get a decent kick of champagne in it, because champagne really makes it. And go right to the brim. Slauncha. Thanks, Leslie. I can now firmly declare that the French 75 is my drink of choice for the season ahead. Don't forget to post your fabulous pictures of what you're wearing, what you're drinking, who you're with. Hashtag IE Style Live 21 on Twitter and a fabulous prize for the best post. Now, Anne-Marie O'Connor is the fashion editor at the Irish Examiner and she's joining us to talk style in a brand new world. Now that in real life interactions are back on the agenda, the burning question abides. Anne-Marie. What is the new dress code? The new dress code is basically softer, less restrictive iteration of what we knew to be classical office wear. So it's basically a reflection of our new flexible lifestyles. A lot of us are going back to the office, you know, October 22nd marks returning to society. It's a big date. It's a big date. And many of us have returned to the office and it depends on what it looks like for you. But hybrid is the key word and hybrid is what we're going to look at in these looks today. Okay. What have you got? Show the first record. one is courtesy of yours truly, Sonia, Lennon Courtney at Dunn Stores. Oh, stop it, Amory. <laughs> And this is what we know as the smart cohort. And we saw it last year with the, these amazing tux trousers that you, you showcased at IE Style Live. And this, this year, it's got itself a little bestie. <laughs> I know. So it's like your AM to PM bestie, I call it, your top and your trouser. And what I love about it is that head to toe, it's one and done. It's the, that cognitive ease that it brings of just knowing you can get dressed and look the part, whether you're working at home or whether you're going to after work networking event, whatever it may be. I love the idea of the divide and conquer ability of this. The top is great. You can wear it with your pair of jeans. Everyone loves a nice top and a pair of jeans of a weekend. That's and this it. ticks that box. But you know, you've got the candy color blocking which makes it appropriate for a Zoom call. But at the same time, the trousers are smart. They're sharply tailored. And I believe we had a quick chat about this before. You're 5'2", I'm six foot, and both of us fit the trousers. Exactly. They are magic trousers. They are magic Can trousers. Can I just say that? <laughs> The cummerbund just, you know, tucks you in quite nicely. You've got the pleat detailing around the ankle and the buttoning and the side stripe. I think it wouldn't look out of place with a t-shirt and an oversized blazer and a pair of heels if you wanted to go out for a drink in the evening. But together, it just looks so appropriate, whether it's with jeans, I mean, I mean whether it's with trainers, even at home, working from your office, or indeed, if you did have to go into the office itself. Sold, sold. I'm sold. getting the memory. I'm getting the memory. One for sure. everyone in the audience. <laughs> so what's your next look? My next look is from H&M. And this look, I believe it's called, it's what I call the transseasonal hack. H&M are really changing their direction from what I've seen. They're offering more pieces that reflect our now, that mix and match with our wardrobes, that you know, reflect the fact that people are you know, maybe cycling to work, commuting to work, so chunky boots, lots of pieces that mix and match rather than the show ponies that we're used to seeing. And may I say you look absolutely beautiful, Ah, uh, thank you. Sitting in front of me and in the video, what a model. 
absolutely Thank you gorgeous. very much. But what's great about this, this look together is, you know, we, our weather at the moment is a bit finicky to say the least. One minute it's 16 degrees, the next it's eight. So we do have a bit of scope to use our dresses that we've been wearing since maybe August, September. And I think the nicest way to get a bit of use out of like a roomy dress like this, I love the look, it's very mm. Yogi Yamamoto. It has that um, Japanese minimalist feel to it, is to add a bit of tailoring. But if you're not someone who likes the suited and booted appeal, then a kimono style gilet is perfect. This gilet has a belt as does the dress itself. And both are made from recycled polyester, which is great. It's part of their conscious collection. So if you're interested in any of the conscious pieces, just look for the green tag. And the green tag means that each piece is made from 50% recycled material. Fantastic. And the boots, may I just say, we all said we were going to put on our heels when the pan when restrictions loosened, but it's hard to wear heels for a length of time after you've been, you know, in slippers for 18 months. You got it. So having a platform sole ankle boot like this is just lovely. It's just, you've got that extra few inches, yet it's also feet friendly as well. And I think that's the real key because I think, you know, we will put on heels the odd time, but it's the, it's the day wear. It's the, how do you get through yeah. day wear with a little bit of elevation, a little bit of smartness. With uh, Comfort is non-negotiable. Non it's non-negotiable. I mean, I think if you've hit the nail on the head. We always thought that we had to rescind comfort when it came to looking professional. But what we've come to realize is that we are neither, we don't want to give up comfort. It is both the psychological and physiological um, necessity. You know, it's, it's going to help ease us out of the pandemic into working into you know, working five days a week in an office again. Oh, that's hang on. And into partying. It's <laughs> into partying, <laughs> I know. And even still, the idea of like putting on, you know, something that isn't cozy and makes you feel kind of cocooned is almost anathema. Like we love the idea of having our cake and eating it too, you know. There's no reason why you shouldn't have that height and be comfortable and you shouldn't be able to turn heads yet look comfy as well. Okay, what have you got next? Next up is from Zara. Now this is our classic suit. The classic suit really isn't going anywhere, but it's been reimagined with much kind of um, 80s realness, if you will. So the 80s maximalism that we've come to know, you know, every, every year we say the 80s is back, but has it ever gone away? But I really think that the 80s has made a comeback as a kickback to restrictions and to everything that we, you know, endured with the pandemic. So these colors that you're seeing are very, you know, era appropriate, you know, that beautiful turquoise blue and the neon yellow. But what I love about this suit are the proportions are far more relaxed. Mm. So as opposed to the classic office wear where things were a bit more nipped and tucked and put together and um, what have you, you've got a much looser silhouette in terms of the jacket, also in terms of the trousers. Now, I find that uh, with um, traditional office wear, the trousers tend to be tapered, mm. and these are much more relaxed and kind of just flexible and a bit more forgiving on your calf. I have bigger calves, and I've always struggled, struggled with trousers. So when I'm sitting down, and then I go to get up, and then mm. they get caught on my calf, and I'm trying to, like, adjust it, these are just fluid, again, representing the kind of the feel that we, we all are looking to embrace, just that ease again. And I'm so glad you've, you've included tailoring, because there's been a bit of... Um, you know, fashion media attention to the death of the suit and the suit is gone and we we'll never go back there. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, fashion is pendular. So it swings one way 100%. and then it swings another way. So I think as much as we are, you know, trying to get back into that sort of smartness, we'll be on an evolutionary journey into, into exactly. you know, and you don't have to give up again. You don't have to give up the suit. It's, it's just rendering it in a different way. And also, if you wanted to go jacket free, that's the beauty of having the knit. You could wear the shirt with the knit, the trouser, and put a like a flat pair of shoes like a loafer. Or indeed, you can decide just to wear the cardigan as a top, which totally. a lot of people are doing at the moment. You could even decide to wear the cardigan as a dress. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Maybe it's a different yeah, occasion. Yeah. Maybe that's a big party. <laughs> just make sure you got the right yes, knickers on. The right, the right knickers. <laughs> Always the right knickers. This is true. What's your next look? Our next look is the business casual equation. 
Um, we kind of tipped on this before. What is business casual? What is the dress code? I've always been asked that pre-pandemic. And I think since the pandemic, people have found their feet with what business casual actually is. And it's, as I said before, it's just a softer iteration, a softer rendering of what you typically wear to the office. This coat is from uh, Samui. I adore this. It's from Harris Wharf, which is a London label, but the duo behind it are Italian. So you have the Italian nous. Um, but it's this beautiful paprika color. Mm. Paprika is my new favorite color. It's like go. a spicy brown. And my favorite crisp flavor as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like a cardigan, Sonia. It's, it's got the tailored feel to it, but it's uh, unlined. It's got the very large patch pockets. So you wouldn't look out of place if you were wearing it inside. Um, and you, it's kind of a sort of Manhattan vibe to it, isn't it? hundred percent. You know, New York low key. I like it. Low a lot. key, yeah. It's that low key luxury that we're looking at. And the sweater beneath it is alpaca and wool mix. So super soft, um, thermogenic, going to keep you warm. Um, inside or outside. Also, did you know alpaca is windproof? <laughs> I had no I idea. Know <laughs> <laughs> so that is by an LA label called Vince, and you've got just the, just the casual roll neck. So unlike the Zara, you know, if you maybe didn't want to wear a shirt and you wanted mm. something, as you said, it's more low key. I paired it with a pair of crop trousers from Acne, which is a Swedish brand. So you have the typical pinstripe trousers, but showing a bit of ankle. Here's I my, see that. Here's the you thing. Saucy the demon, saucy minx. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of showing a bit of ankle because now we still, I think it's still ankle weather. I, I think, think it is. There's still a bit of leverage for that. I agree. So I put it with the vegan leather Veja sneakers, which are super popular. If you want to wear sneakers to the office, just don't wear your gym sneakers. Wear just a classic pair of white trainers. Keep them nice and clean. And Good you have tip. that, yeah, so there you go. Or Amazing. you could wear a nice pair of boots beneath that as well. And, the, you know, the crop it isn't Good really work. an issue. Yeah. So, and also, I think we, if you are commuting and you're on a bike in particular, there's been an uptick in the amount of people who are cycling to work now. We all know the pain of getting like mud splashes on our ankles and like the bottom of our hems. I just think I'm all for a cropped, <laughs> cropped <laughs> hem. Practical solutions Practical all around. Solutions. Now, Amory, we have some questions yes. from our uh, audience. Lillian in Cork says, and I don't know whether you should be taking this or I should be taking this. <laughs> I'm just we'll over five it. foot. Any tips on how to wear clothes to make me look taller than I am? Yeah, I think it's more about not trying to be something that you're not, but trying to enhance your proportions and to work with what you have. Well said. You know, um, I think in particular, what I get from petites and petites that I work with, I always say try and, you know, much like the ankle, try and show a bit of neck as well. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a sweetheart neckline or it's a deep V or it's an off the shoulder and balance that with maybe a three quarter um, length sleeve or a full sleeve up to the wrist, no further than that because mm -hmm. you don't want to be swamped in any material. Likewise with your trousers, you want to make sure a nice high waist, a lot of petites think they can't get away with a high waist, you can. Mm -hmm. They'll el elongate, you want, it's the rule of thirds. So you want your top of your body to, it's your body should be divided instead of half and half into a third and two thirds. Mm -hmm. So think of like people like Audrey Hepburn, you know, you've seen her wear like very high waisted trousers before. Make sure they're like a skinny flare. So again, it elongates at the ankle. Without drowning. Yeah, without drowning you in the fabric. So it's all about little little increments, knowing the, the, the nips and the tuck, but the rule of thirds is really important. And actually, Linda, the, the cohort, the, the Lennon Courtney cohort would be great yes. on you because it's one colour all the way down, so one you're getting color. that elongation if you're, if you're working in that Exactly, time. and you know, monochrome as well is, is like you hit the nail on the head, and also for um, for shoes. So depending on your skin type, whether, you know, you are, it's a nude shoe or a black shoe, make sure you elongate the silhouette by wearing one that is, um, following the follow, line, of the, following the line of the tone. Yeah. A hundred percent. And if you're wearing a black tight, wear a little black, um, cowboy boot. Rachel Bilson, I know she doesn't, she's not a name you hear of anymore, but she's always a petite. She always comes up on my Pinterest board. <laughs> I don't know why I'm six foot tall. Certain but, people yeah. do follow me around but, Pinterest but, as well. <laughs> but she always gets the proportions right. Look her up. She Excellent. may not be acting a lot anymore, but she's definitely nailing it. We love you, stage. Rachel. Um, <laughs> Helena O'Keefe wants to know, how do I dress for my age? I'm in my late 40s. Is there an age when you should stop following trends? 
sh should stop following trends. Hmm. I am 48. And I think I had this question last year as well. Mm. And I said, it's um, evolution, not revolution. Mm. I don't believe, I think what you need to do and what we all really need to do, regardless of age, is to audit your lifestyle. And this is the same advice that I give when I'm clearing out people's closets. And it's because they're dressing the person that they were rather than the person that they are today, regardless of your age. So we've gone through a pandemic, and if that has shown us anything, is that change can happen, it can happen rapidly, and things can change you know, in a, in a New York minute, as the saying goes. Mm -hmm. But often, what, when we see the most change, it's over about three years. So look back over three years and see what has changed for you. Um, for a lot of women our age, you know, late 40s, perimenopause is a big issue. And that affects, you know, both your body in terms of its shape and also your hair and everything that goes along with it. And your fabric it. choices. And your fabric choices. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm noticing that my whole color palette has changed and I've had to make these small increments as well. I can't wear black anymore. I look like a great corpse, but, you know. And I can't wear a red lip anymore. It's So it's about knowing, it's always keeping an eye on things rather than waiting for it to get to, um, I, I suppose, peak panic. And when it comes to trends, trends, what do you like? What do you like and do you? But do see what you, what you can do for you now, mm -hmm. the person that you are today. So I may not be able to wear crop tops anymore. But I might be... I definitely can't wear crop tops. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there are certain things, like, I know I can't wear crop tops, I know I can't wear, you know, I, I nix out certain things, and I'm like, eh, maybe that won't look so good. But I know I love my suits, I know I love check, I know I love floral and vintage. There are certain things that I, I keep an, an eye on, and I'm always looking to kind of um, innovate and just kind of tweak. It's like an NCT. You take your car for an NCT every year. You should be taking yourself for an NCT. Not, you know, you know, you know what I mean, so to speak. Just like check in with yourself and make, make yourself a priority and just think, and Pinterest is such a great resource. I'm constantly pinning things. And what I do is I look for patterns and I tell my clients the same thing. What do you see? What do you like? And blue sky, pin up anything. And then go back and see, you'll have a moment where you go, oh, dear Lord, what was I thinking? <laughs> and then you can get rid of that. But and you're I not... think that's the antidote to trends, isn't it? It's yeah. owning your personal style and knowing it. And, and knowing once you it. have that, you can move on. We have, a, we have another question here from Nora Peters. What are the top five wardrobe staples of any woman's wardrobe? I think a great coat. A great, what I notice for a lot of women when they're going to weddings in particular, they don't have outerwear. Mm. So they spend a lot on the guna and, and the shoes and the accessories, and then they, they pick any old coat to go over it. I think a great full length, whether it's single breasted or double breasted, crombie, uh, just a very classic coat, go for black, go for cream, go for a nude or whatever color floats your boat, but one, one that is that you'll get the most wear out of. You know, um, if you prefer something bright, then wear something bright by all means. Uh, definitely a good coat. Great pair of shoes. My grandfather was a shoemaker and he was um, a sailmaker as well. And they didn't have a lot of money. My mom's family, they grew up, she grew up on an island on the west coast of Ireland. And my gosh, you would not be seen in mass unless you had decent shoes on. And he always said to her, Irene, you, your shoes are the backbone of any outfit. You can buy a cheaper dress, but you need to have a good pair of shoes. So, you know, make sure it's a good pair of what, whatever you wear the most, a good pair of flat shoes. Always a good pair of heels is, is great to have in the back of the wardrobe. A dress, a dress that will go with anything. A dress that you're likely to wear the most of. Everyone talks about the little black dress. It can be a little blue dress. It could be a little green dress. It could be the dress that looks best on you, that you will wear, that you can maybe dress up and dress That's down. That's it. We call it the sleeper dress, one that can do many, many things. <laughs> yes. You know, it just, it sort of slides into your wardrobe, slides into an event, and you can accessorize it however you wish. Yeah. It's not a show pony to the extent that, you know, people are like, oh, she's, you know, we've that seen dress that before. Again. That dress <laughs> that old dress again, you know? And it's going back to the kind of the French, the Gallic way of thinking of, you know, you, you buy that very expensive, maybe that Chanel piece, you know, there's a tradition of buying a, a really good Chanel jacket or a great Chanel um, dress and, and having it for life. 
So you take it to your seamstress and you, um, you know, we were talking about trends earlier. You might bring the hem up or bring the hem down or get it taken in to your proportions. It's about getting what fits you best. And you switch it up with like a great scarf, um, a, a pearls. I'm sorry, I just have Marge Simpson running through my Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the only image I can see right now. A great scarf, pearls, uh, high heels, whatever it is, you can switch it up with your accessories that way. But So dress, a coat, a pair of, um, a good pair of shoes, and a good bag as well. Uh, what I've noticed as well with, with a, lot, a lot of clients that I deal with is they'll have, the, this is going into workwear, but bear with me if you will, um, a, a bag, not just your, your handbag, but a bag that you can take for carrying everything. Now, we probably are seeing, if there's a death of anything, the death of the useless handbag, mm -hmm. and more of a bag that can take us from A to B, whether it's carrying your technology in a way that if you met a client, you're not taking things out of like a gym kit, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever it may be, or throwing it into any old bag. So really good functional tote. A good tote. functional tote. There's a great brand called Aoife, Aoife Lifestyle. She, um, her name is Aoife. It's um, an Irish brand and she makes a lot of functional bags. So they double up as backpacks, they double up as totes. Um, I, I think it's in the Irish Examiner IE Style magazine that will be out with the Irish Examiner on Saturday. So she's definitely worth looking into um, incredible, like beautiful, beautifully tooled bags, but ones that you'll invest in and again, it's something that will see you in good stead, especially in your, your working life. We have one more VT look that we should throw to, I think. Yes, yes. Now, this is from Brown Thomas Cork, and it is um, kind of similar to yours in, this, in the sense that it's a cord, but I'm calling it the twin set twist. This is a knitted cord from Victoria by Victoria Beckham. So this is her diffusion line. It's a stretch fused fabric. So it's a really tight, um, it's a beautiful knit. So it, everything kind of sucks everything in. Nice. <laughs> nice. Without, it feels like, like invisible spanks. What I like about this is the one and done appeal. I think if you are maybe in a more senior position and perhaps you prefer a skirt to a trouser, this might be an option. What I love about the sweater is that you could put a white shirt beneath that, the little tails of the shirt showing, and a pair of herringbone trousers, and you've got a lovely look there. You could take the skirt and you could wear it with a polo neck, and you could have a little like knitted sleeveless number over that as well. Or you could just take a cashmere sweater that you have from home and make it super simple. But I think this is great because it introduces the neon that we saw in Zara, but in a much more considered way. Yeah. So for people who are like going, ooh, the Zara's a bit extra, this might you know, prove that with color blocking done well, yeah. like yourselves, you can wear these very bright colors in a way that it's comfortable. It's comfortable. Yeah. it's comfortable. And what's comfortable about this are these boots. They're by Steve Madden. Really great price point from Brown Thomas. These are the chunkier tractor sole boots. Um, and it just shows that you needn't have wear the high heel or the, the, the block heel shoe. You know, you don't have to go completely ladylike. You can wear it, dress it down. So there's a lot more wearability to these pieces than people um, realize, I think. People I think, think there's more tolerance in the world for yes. our wardrobe choices now yeah. as well. We've one more question from Karen Jackson. What is the most sustainable piece of, your, of clothing in your wardrobe and why? These. Aha. These shoes. Now, believe it or not, we have we both have these We're shoes. Twinning. I have yeah. them in jade <laughs> at home. They're Dries van Noten. They're Dries van Noten. I bought these in 2009 um, I, on sale, in J January sales from a boutique that's long gone, unfortunately, uh, called Smock. And um, they were half price and they owe me money, as my sister says at this stage. <laughs> I have never had to take them to a cobbler. I have never had a moment where I've thought, oh my God, my feet are killing me. Um, they are just, they're, they're a high enough heel because they're almost four inches, but they're rendered in such a way that there's not that pressure on the ball of your feet. They're sustainable because I have very few high heels, funnily enough. I have one other pair of shoes that probably gets as much wear time as these, and everything else are sneakers and flats. 
So in terms of like high heels, these are winner, winner, chicken dinner. I think so. And that is the key, really. Sustainability is about endurance. It's about circularity. Yeah. It's about value, really. Mm -hmm. um, Amory O'Connor, you are literally the purveyor of sartorial hope. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So now you're armed with all the top tips to parade yourself into the new season. Don't forget to share those pictures enjoying your fabulous French 75 cocktails at home and we will select one lucky person from all those tweeting to win that fantastic prize from Mahon Point Shopping Centre. I know you already have it spent. Now, our definitions of beauty are finally beginning to broaden and wonderful conversations are being had about claiming our relevance as women at every age. But one thing is for sure, when we feel happy in our skin, it shows. COVID has given us a lot of time to reflect and to prioritise self-care and balance. The tyranny of Zoom has seen us gazing at our reflections more than ever before. As a result, a campaign of self-care has begun, I know that has with me, a rapid surge of maintenance treatments covers everything from medical must-dos to teeth cleaning and of course the aesthetic realm of skin. So what are the treatments? that make promises that they actually keep. Dr. Claude O'Shea, aesthetic medical specialist at the Beacon Face and Dermatology, is internationally recognized and renowned for her natural approach to skin rejuvenation. Claude has clinics in Dublin and Cork and is a highly sought after practitioner. Claude, you are so welcome to IE Style Live. Thanks for joining us this evening. Hi, Sonia. Thank you so much. And thank you for that glowing introduction. <laughs> to match your glowing um, skin, Claudia. <laughs> good, thanks. <laughs> it's the daylight. You can't beat it. Now, listen, I am a firm bel believer in getting the basics right. So what are mm. the basics of skincare for every age? Um, so, Sonia, you're dead right. Um, the basics is really where you have to start. And there are obviously, you know, a lot of invasive treatments available. But unless you have the fundamentals of a good skincare routine in place, you're kidding yourself really. So the basics of skincare, um, obviously I'll just go through the most important ingredients anyone needs in their routine. Um, so this will apply to the bulk of the listeners this evening. Um, to keep it simple, we'll divide it into a morning and an evening routine. In the morning, uh, if you do nothing else but put on a vitamin C serum and an SPF onto your skin before you leave the house, you'll be doing incredibly well. Vitamin C is what's known as an antioxidant, okay? So it prevents oxidation. Basically, as we go out during the day, our skin is exposed to a lot of um, environmental stressors, such as smoking, pollution, um, what we eat, what we drink, harsh weather conditions. All of these things will um, accelerate aging, okay? And they're going to cause premature aging. So vitamin C is what's going to help stop and prevent a lot of that. Um, now, vitamin C... She's a bit of a diva, okay? Um, very difficult to actually get vitamin C in a bottle um, in the correct percentage, at the correct pH, in the correct formulation. So for that reason, I would always urge my clients to opt for medical grade products and medical grade lines. They're what's the also known as cosmeceuticals. Grade. Sorry, so this is cosmeceuticals. And so medical mm. grade, does that mean that you need advice from a practitioner, from a, a professional? It usually would be. Cosmeceutical products wouldn't be found in your, um, you know, your department stores and pharmacies. They're normally guided and, you know, they're normally sold in, you know, um, skin clinics and they would be um, advised by, you know, doctors or, or skin therapists. So, yes, they're a little bit more difficult to get your hands on. But, you know, the difference between cosmeceuticals and cosmetics, um, cosmetic products are what are found usually, as I said, in those big department stores and your pharmacies. And, you know, actually legally, they're not allowed to promote any changes in the skin cells. So you need to opt for cosmeceuticals. And these have been backed by a lot of research and a lot of scientific studies. So you know you're going to get the results that they promise. So they're the Jedi Knights of skincare, basically. They really are. And you don't need to, you know, not every product you have in your skincare routine needs to be a cosmeceutical product but certainly when it comes to things like your vitamin c um, and other products that i'll go on to in the evening you should really be opting for your medical grade or your cosmeceutical lines so your vitamin c if your spf is your batman your vitamin c is your robin okay they're going to work beautifully together spf it's not the most glamorous product in the world, but it is the most important product you can have in your routine. I know it's tempting to buy the latest serum or the latest anti-aging moisturizer, 
But SPF is the number one. 80% of premature aging is caused by ultraviolet radiation. Um, and even though we may think we're living in a very rainy, dull, cloudy um, country, and we don't need to worry about that, we do. Um, the type of radiation that causes aging is present all year round and it can penetrate windows and um, glass. So even if you're inside all day working on a computer inside a window, you're still going to get aging. You can see a lot of, um, so interesting, you can see a lot of um, truck drivers who've, you know, exposed one side of their face their whole life to the car window and that side of their face has aged an awful lot faster than the other side. So, um, your vitamin C and your SPF, if you add two things into your routine after this evening, they're the two that I urge you to um, introduce because prevention is key. And can I ask you then, just uh, as, as a, a sort of, on behalf of our audience, let's say, mm. so the, the, the vitamin C supplement that you might take uh, in the morning, uh, is that going to help your skin or does it need to be a topical cream? So it's going to do no harm because, you know, a well-balanced diet is crucial. But unfortunately, when I'm speaking about vitamin C, it's the topical form of vitamin C. Um, that's the one that's going to promise you those results, not the oral form. So it's a topical serum. Vitamin C is water soluble. So a good vitamin C is always going to be in serum form, not necessarily in a moisturizer. So to bear that in mind, um, we sell um, lines such as SkinCeuticals and Obagi would be my two favourite um, vitamin Cs on the market at the moment. Okay, I hope you've got a pen and a paper out there. Mm. I am taking mental notes. So what about the <laughs> nighttime routine? So the nighttime routine then changes a little. While the morning routine is always about protection and those two products are going to be put on your face 365 days a year. The evening routine is a little bit more exciting and it changes a little bit, okay? So there are certain ingredients we need to get into our nighttime routine, but we don't want to use them every night. We don't want to use them seven nights a week or overdo it. But the most important ingredients that we do need in our nighttime routine and use them possibly two nights a week would be a retinoid, Okay, so retinoid, retinol, retinoic acid, um, they all fall under the umbrella term of retinoids. And essentially they're vitamin A. Vitamin A really is the holy grail when it comes to anti-aging. It's probably the ingredient that has most research to back it up. And that is what's going to help stimulate collagen. It's going to help reorganize your elastin. So basically it's going to keep oh, your skin. I've just been saying I needed my elastin reorganized. It's so good Fabulous. to know. <laughs> That's what a coincidence. <laughs> I'm only going to uh, recondo my elastin this season. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Declosure uh, the skin. Um, but retinol really, and there's a lot of talk about retinols. People are a little bit scared of them. They're fearful because they see the side effects. Basically, a retinol is going to make your skin behave as if it's 10 years younger. It's incredibly stimulating. And because it's so stimulating, it can cause side effects such as redness and peeling, which is why a lot of people are scared to start. So I do urge people to seek, you know, um, you know, a, a skin specialist or a doctor for a uh, you know, that initial consultation, because they will guide you on how to start a retinol, because depending on your sensitivities, you know, you may need to start in an incredibly low dose. But I would urge everyone to consider adding a retinoid into your routine. I've, I've, I've just mentioned really the top three ingredients, in my opinion, okay. vitamin C, SPF and a retinoid. If they're in your routine, you're doing incredibly well and you are going to, your future self will thank you an awful lot for introducing those ingredients into your routine. And I guess the one thing about retinoids is that um, they, they are not friends of the sun. So it makes sense to include that in your nighttime routine rather than your daytime routine. Absolutely. They can be broken down by the sun and they can also make your skin a little bit more sensitive to sun damage. So it's nighttime. The rule of thumb is to start low and slow. So a low percentage and to slowly incorporate them into your routine. Um, with that, the other nights of the week, it's really important to exfoliate the skin at any age. An interesting thing about exfoliants is when I mention exfoliants to my clients, they will always think of physical scrubs. Mm. And I would always advise them to stay away from those physical scrubs. It's chemical exfoliants are our best friends. So they're the acids. They sound a little bit more harsh than the physical scrubs when you hear the word acid. But in reality, they're an awful lot more gentle on the skin and they have wonderful benefits. So glycolic acid, lactic acid, salicylic acid, they're all chemical exfoliants. And depending on your specific skin type will depend on which one you use. But lactic is 
the, the one that most people start with. It's for sensitive skin types. And using an exfoliant two or three times a week is going to ensure your skin stays bright and exfoliated and polished. Um, so they go hand in hand with a retinol. Um, and then the other nights, you just need to make sure that you're hydrating your skin as well, which is really important. Hyaluronic acid is a huge buzzword. It's a real buzzword in the aesthetic industry. It's found in serums, in moisturizers, um, and it's a wonderful product that everybody can use. Really, you can't under or overuse it. Um, and I would urge everyone to have a hyaluronic acid in their routine, especially coming into the winter. Um, that with a nice moisturizer is going to keep your skin hydrated for the winter months. So, so I suppose in summary, Sonia, um, and I could I could speak about this for eight hours, never mind ten minutes, but ensuring that you have a vitamin C and SPF a retinoid, an exfoliant, and some sort of hydrating serum in your routine is a wonderful start. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's that's a wonderful skincare routine to have in Fantastic. place. Fantastic. Great tips. So in in uh, you may not know this at home, but um, Dr. Claude O'Shea is actually 69 years old. <laughs> Look at the effects of her skincare routine. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> so... So the, the, that's the basics, right? So if we want to level up, so I know that you, um, as a practitioner, uh, mm. perform a lot of treatments um, that can take yeah. the skin to the next level. You know, mm -hmm. what? where would you start with that for somebody who doesn't know the area at all? Yeah, so what's really important for people to understand, Sonia, and I get it, and I get people are apprehensive when it comes to more invasive treatments. And we just spoke about the importance of a skincare routine, but it's also equally important to um, not over rely on skincare. Unfortunately, it can only get you so far and it does have its limitations. Basically, because underneath the layer of skin, we have muscles, fat pads, we have bone that all go through changes as we age. So the best retinoid and vitamin C in the world won't, you know, um, won't have an effect on aging that's caused by those lower structures. So we do need to rely on some treatments to have a really nice 360 degree approach to Anti-aging is one word, but even pro-aging is a word I prefer to use because we're not trying to stop the aging process. We're just trying to age as gracefully as possible. So treatments-wise, Sonia, um, there's probably two main categories. There is the more, you know, there's the facial treatments, which would refer to any treatments that are going to help the skin, um, such as microneedling, uh, lasers, medical grade facials, peels. They're all going to help your skin look as youthful um, and as bright as possible. And they're treatments that you would probably do on a monthly basis, okay, depending on what you need. Um, I think if you're doing peels or hydrofacial, like, sorry, hydrofacials is just a medical grade facial we offer, but a good medical grade facial, if you're keeping on top of them on a monthly basis, that's fabulous. But um, while they will keep your skin looking bright, there are certain signs of aging and lines and wrinkles on the face that are caused by those lower structures such as muscle movement or changes in our fat pads and they are they are you know they mean that we have to rely on some more invasive treatments and that's when we run into the injectable side of things so things like botox fillers profilo skin boosters these are all injectables that are usually done two to three times a year um, and Really, if you stay on top of your skincare, look at the facial treatments, maybe on a six weekly basis, and then two or three times a year, staying on top of the injectables, that means you're going to, you know, you're going to be looking after all aspects of aging. And it means you're going to, results are going to remain very subtle and very natural. And that's the approach I like to take, um, really. So there are your three main categories that you're, you know, that you need to stay on top of if you're really serious about trying to slow down the aging process. So what are the treatments that are coming down the line, brand new technologies that we maybe haven't heard of yet? What, what are we looking forward to? Yeah, so, you know, there's a few coming down the line. I suppose, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on non-invasive treatments. So moving away from the injectable side of things and looking at ultrasound energy, um, and radio frequency energy to tighten the skin. You know, these are all all going to mimic the results of facelifts and, and neck lifts. And when lifts, can we get them? You're, you're be <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you down. I'll fantastic, <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. I'll let you know ASAP. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on those kind of treatments and there's a lot of research going on um, with those kind of things. From the injectable side of things, um, 
you know, Profilo is a new treatment. It's it's new enough on the market, but a lot of people still haven't heard of it. It's a skin booster. It's basically an injectable form of moisturizer. Basically, that hyaluronic acid serum that we spoke about is wonderful, but it can only get in so far. Um, so Profilo is like injecting hyaluronic acid in deeper into the skin. So it's, as I said, like that injectable form of moisturizer. Um, so those type of skin boosters are getting incredibly um, popular because people that aren't quite ready for the more invasive filler treatment will opt for these skin boosters because they're just, you know, they're not going to create, you know, they're, they're very subtle, but they are going to majorly slow down the aging process and give your skin that beautiful hydrated, dewy radiance that everybody wants hydrated dewy radiance that's what we're after mm. right that is exactly so what you, we're you're after. at the color face of this sector you you mm. know everything that's happening i have one killer question for you if you mm. were to create the ultimate treatment of the future what would it be the ultimate treatment oh yeah so i suppose when it comes to products i'm going to be very boring and go for an spf that remain you know something like there are those products on the market at the moment these powder spfs there i have my issues with them so i would love to create this spf spray that you know stays active all day long and you don't need to worry about it we'll all be um, your guinea pigs we'll 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 do a, the, the pre pre uh, pre-sale testing <laughs> good woman thank you i'll be on to you also i will um so products wise yeah i'm going to stay boring and go for something to do with spf um, and make it a little bit more accessible to people Treatments wise, I suppose um, at the moment, the best type of injectables, you still need to stay on top of them two, three times a year. So ideally creating something a little bit more longer lasting is, is what I would love to, you know, see down the line. Um, fillers that last a little bit longer, Botox that you get a little bit longer than three to four months out of would probably get, you know, put me out of a job. But <laughs> it would be incredibly effective. So um lengthening the I suppose how long you get out of these products would be key your, your own sustainability march I love it I love mm, it well Claude, exactly thank you so much for joining us you are literally you, your Sonia. own best advertisement for good oh, skin you're very thank kind you. thank you and march on we can't wait to see your products fabulous fabulous thanks Sonia so now we know exactly what to do to glow for the rest of our days Cecilia Ahern has sold 25 million books populated by fierce and flawed characters, living in the in-between times. Not quite here, not quite there, just like all of us. She's written 18 books that have had a magnetic pull to the screen and tap into the emotional zeitgeist of her audience. Cecilia, I have just finished Freckles your latest book. And the premise is that we are the product of the five people that we spend the most time with. I didn't want to dwell on that too much, but... I need to know, from a creative point of view, how did that particular book come into being? Um, well, it was thanks to my brother-in-law, Nikki Byrne, actually, who uh, about five years ago said it to me, I think in a very polite way, trying to tell me that I'm morphing into my mother. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Choose wisely. And, you know, when you hear something sometimes, it was it's a simple phrase, but it asked so many questions. So what I do is that I immediately go, well, I did think about myself, of course, but then immediately went into how can I tell this as a fictional story? So that's how it came about. Um, yeah, just, it's a Jim Ron. You probably know it's a Jim Ron motivational business quote. Um, you know, if you want to be the best, then be around the best, basically. So I just, my mind just, it's that light bulb moment where um, a book suddenly, the whole story sparked from that one phrase. And it's funny, isn't it? Because as, as, as we grow older, we do tend to, to be more mindful of the people we surround ourselves with and, and what their impact on us is. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, so it's about a character who's very, like, she follows the rules. She's a, a parking warden. So she's, she's a very rigid person. Um, and when she hears this, she takes it as a guideline. So she actually starts examining the five people in her life, what their characters say about who she is. And then she decides to choose a very specific set of five people so that she can kind of curate her life and shape her, her own identity. I liked the idea that you can take control of who you are. You know, if you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, then you choose who you are. And, I, and certainly I'm someone who's very... Um, I have a small group, but my, my core group is strong, you know, and I think I am like that. I do kind of screen 
my five people. Um, and that's almost anyway, like a self-preservation mode, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it's... Um, we, we learn, we hear so much about toxic relationships, you know, and, and you don't, not necessarily, what you don't want to be surrounded by yes people, but you do want to have people who are encouraging, who lift you up, who inspire you, who educate you, uh, who ground you. I think that that's a really important. Um, but people who also challenge your thoughts, I think is very important. Um, but not to have people who drag you down and make you feel bad about yourself. And I think, you know, my character certainly learns that, that it's about um, finding people who lift you up and make you want to be better, um, but also about finding a place where you fit in. You, you don't have to change yourself to fit in with the average five. You should be able to find your own tribe. And that's kind of her mission and, and my mission. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually it was something, you know, I did finish the book last night and it was something that your character uh, Tristan said around who he is to different people. I think, I always think that's very interesting that, you know, as, as we grow and develop as people, we often end up back in the same bucket that people have put us in at the beginning of our relationships, but we're not the same person anymore. Yeah, and, and I think that's true, particularly of women, you know, that we have so many roles with different people in our life. You know, you're the wife, you're the mother, you're the, the friend, the whatever. And, um, and I'm sure men would say they have the same position, but um, I do think that women have to be a lot of people through different people. Um, and we're all the time changing. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with someone yesterday who kind of said the, the opposite to what I said, which is a lot of my friends are from, you know, from, from 11 years old when I started school and, and you can change together. I mean, if you met each other now, you might not be best friends, <laughs> but that you, you know each other and you grow together and you learn together and you're there, you know, for the, for the long haul. And I think when you get older, you do become more particular about who you're meeting. Um, does that person fit into your life? Do you trust them? You know, um, and so, yeah, so I, I like to stick with my, I love to meet new people also, but I think that the people that are in your inner, inner core are the people that you know for a very long time. And, and there's something of the circus quality about those people, I always think, that, you know, you, you lay down your life for them. You don't always like them, but you love them so deeply that, that it doesn't really matter, you know? And I, I just, I love that. You spoke about the fact that Nikki um, inspired this book five years ago with a comment he made, you know, and, and I, I want to know a little bit more about that because I'm interested in your inner filing system. What is the creative process and what's that sort of percolation that goes on to get from one nugget of a conversation into, into a, a best-selling book? Yeah, well, you want to know my inner file. I will show you my, my actual physical filing system, which I have here. Look at this simple little notebook. It's got a lot of ideas. It's got, you know, sometimes some articles that I find in newspapers. I can, if I come up with an idea, I email, my, email myself, cut it out, stick it in here. And um, so this is just full of ideas. Sometimes it's just characters. Sometimes it's title ideas. Sometimes it's just a one-liner. Um, but the thing is, it takes time for, for a story. You could have come up with a very good idea, but it's not a novel. So um, it takes me a little while. I, I said about five years on average. You know, sometimes I've come up with an idea and written it immediately if it comes like fully formed. But I do spend time. I think when I heard the idea for Freckles, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, I instantly had another character in my head from, from another few years ago that I realized she'd be perfect in this story. Um, and then you spend a while trying to think, well, what is, you know, that's it. That's the tagline. But what is it really about? You know, what's really going on in her life? Who is she? What's the backstory? And where are the many different ways that you can take it? And that takes time to grow. So it's constantly thinking. So, so OK, so that's the, if you like, percolation period where it's all coming together and all the strands are coming together. So do you know instinctively when it's ready to go to the page? Yeah. I know, you know, this is part of the reason why I love writing is that moment of adrenaline rush when you get when I when I come up with an idea. It's, it's genuinely, my heart is pounding, my blood is pumping. I'm like, it's the most exciting thing ever. You know, it's very addictive uh, to come up with a good idea. Um, and it's when I can't get it out of my head, when it just keeps growing and growing and new characters are coming and new ideas are coming. And I really know when it's time to write when I hear the character's voice. Uh, so with... For Freckles, I was, you know, the very inspiring moment you have in life when you're bringing the bins out. <laughs> so it was so dark, well. it was wet. <laughs> <laughs> I was bringing the bins out and I crunched on a snail. And I hate that feeling. But all of a sudden I heard Allegra's 
whose nickname is Freckles, her voice came to me crystal clear. And I immediately grabbed a pen and paper and wrote the prologue. So that just came from standing on a snail. But I, I have to figure out often, are they sarcastic? Are they innocent? Are they naive? Are they optimistic person? Are they, who are they? I need to hear, I suppose, the tone of their voice, which will then set the tone of the novel. And I just heard her. She was just broken at the start. She had been stepped on. Her outer layer was cracked. She felt smushed. And that was my beginning point for her. So gorgeous. And in talking to you in, in sort of in advance of this, I'm really taken by the fact that that sort of really sort of beautiful, ephemeral creativity that's floating, you know, in your head, in your notebook, in the spoken word, then gets bottled into a very rigorous process, um, which is timelined. So you, by your own admission, you're a one book a year author. What happens? You sit down, you take all that beautiful stuff and, and, and how do you discipline yourself or what is the discipline? I, you know, I love Jo Malone Candles. I met Jo Malone on a, on a TV show a couple of years ago and I fangirled her um, with absolute excitement um, because I always light the lime, basil and mandarin candle when I'm writing. And she explained to me that, um, well, scent is like a trigger, you know, which we know if you smell something, it can bring you back to your childhood or back to a certain moment in your life. And she said that what I was doing was triggering my mind to get into the creative zone. So I think without realizing it, I do that. I spent a certain amount of time getting the story ready in my head. I watch it over and over like it's a, like it's a movie in my head. I, I hear the dialogue. I watch the scenes. And then I know it's time to write. So I light that candle. Um, usually begin in, in January. Pandemic aside, let's just talk about what I used to do. Usually begin in January. Um, book is due in May. I edit for the summer and then it's published in the autumn. And that's uh, that's what I've been doing for the past 18 years. <laughs> it's almost militaristic. I love that. I mean, I love the rigour of it. You know, it's... it's I, I'm a very... Um, it sounds robotic, but I think I prefer to say ryth rhythm, very rhythmic person. Um, I love getting... Like, with my life, I think that's just how I function. I like the rhythm of things. And um, which is the one thing I think I have in common with the character Allegra in Freckles, who's, he, you know, she's... She she just likes the rhythm of life. Everything the same thing happens all the time at the same time, um, and but that's how I'm productive. It's kind of like a like a life brainwashing. I think I do to but myself. But it is. I think it's it's that, and it's the one thing that we all strive for is the development of positive habits. You know, and yeah. and that kind of almost Pavlovian response that you're, you know, you know what's coming next, and there's a comfort in that. So yeah, I mean, I I I think we can all take inspiration from that discipline. Um, I want to go back though uh, to a, a very particular book in your uh, oeuvre, if you like. Um, I want to talk about Roar, um, a very special, very unusual book born out of frustration. Right? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So, um, well, there's thirty stories. I'd love to tell you that you know the um, inspiration for all of them, but obviously we don't have time for that. But um. So the very first thing that inspired it, I was in LA talking to a casting agent and we were talking about, um, oh, what's, I always forget the word for um, 18 to 35 year olds. What's that word when you... Demographic. Thank you, Sonia. You're welcome. Demographics. <laughs> we were talking about demographics and, and about my, my books and why they're appealing to TV networks um, because they're appealing to advertisers um, and it was all, it was just like the most depressing conversation I think any kind of... dissolve a little bit at that point? <laughs> ripples. And I thought, well, obviously they like the ideas too. However, um, <laughs> I felt, oh, it, it just, it didn't feel creative and lovely uh, as I wanted it to be. And so I did two things after that. I wrote a screenplay called Old. <laughs> um, and sorry, the particular conversation we'd had where she was telling me about um, demographics. She stopped at women at 54. And I said, well, what about women who are over 54? And she said, oh, no, there's no demographic for them. And I thought, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Um, so, and then I thought, well, not only do women report to feeling invisible as they get older, and, not, and we knew, and things have changed so much now because this was over 10 years ago, um, and we never really saw older women on TV. or They were there, but they weren't the central character, and the story was never about them. But I was hearing the reasons why, because 
because the advertisers weren't interested. They couldn't get money out of older women buying things, which I don't believe either. Um, so anyway, I wrote this story about the woman who slowly disappeared. And it was about a woman who was um, in her 50s. She was experiencing menopause. She was going through menopause and felt like she was just disappearing from the world and nobody could see her. Um, that just inspired the 29 other stories that came. Uh, every time I got kind of irritated or frustrated by something, I just wrote this short story and immediately felt better. Uh, the second one was guilt, was the woman who found bite marks. And I wrote that when I went back to work after having, uh, after maternity leave. And um, I'll never forget, like I, I literally have handwritten it at the very, at the end of it, I have now go home, Cecilia. So it was kind of like a therapy for me. Um, you know, you can't, you can't let the eat guilt, they can't let the guilt eat you alive. You do have to do things for yourself as well. So that whole collection uh, meant the world to me. And um and sorry, I'm babbling, but literally no, spent no, a long not time. At all. And and I think it's it's just it was such a moment in time, I think. And 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 I spoke about Zeitgeist earlier on. It was like dovetailing with this um power surge. Uh it, with women of a certain age going, hang on a second, lads, uh, we're still here. And actually, we're a growing demographic. Uh, we have money to spend. And if we have money to spend, we have power to wield. Um, and I, I think it just, it was just, your timing was just perfection with that. Well, I have to laugh at that because my timing wasn't because it took me about five years. I was trying to, you know, I really wanted it to be a TV series. It was so visual, it was very surreal kind of magic metaphor um which I love because it really shines a light on human truth often more than not you know than than regular writing and uh I went out it wasn't working here people weren't interested it wasn't for them it was no, hang on super- Cecilia the gatekeepers weren't interested and I think that's the difference your timing was yes. right but the gatekeepers weren't ready the audience was begging for it yeah true true yeah yeah, and then I and then what happened was I went to LA to, to have completely different meetings about something else. Um, and Trump had just been inaugurated and the women's marches were were happening that week. And so it was a very heightened kind of anxious time for people, um, fearful time. Um, but people were ready to get active and do something. And I they said to me, Well, those are the ideas aside, what are you most passionate about now? And I went, and I went straight into the roar stories and honestly. The atmosphere in the room changed. You know, people were crying, people were sharing stories. Um, and then that's how war finally found its way to the screen. So yeah, timing, timing is everything. We know this, you know. Uh, but it it took me a long time to get my timing right. <laughs> I think that's the key though, right? We have to allow for the rhythm to to come and find us sometimes. But yeah. you know, let's let's be clear. Um the Roar has finished filming. Uh, with Nicole Kidman's production company. Um, it's just extraordinary. It's it's going to be an amazing televisual experience. Uh, you know, you, you started at a pretty high bar. And, and I think both you and your audience know that you're getting better and better and better at what you do. Um, and I mean that with, with love. Everything is just maturing into something so beautiful. What is next? more you know if you can sustain it uh, I always want to get better and better and better and I think what I've learned is that um I either don't do these tv and film things or I do them with more involvement and I think that's what I've been trying to do over the last couple of years is just have more control have be involved in all the conversations and um, so I'm, I'm writing a tv series at the moment um with the hope to to be the showrunner of that and I think that's going to continue writing novels, but uh, certainly want to move more towards telling TV, telling stories in film and TV. Cut out the gatekeepers. Absolutely mm-hmm. own it. So is is this your own production company eventually? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know it's taken me long enough, but you know, I'm nearly 20 years writing novels and working in TV and film in various different forms, whether it's, you know, creating them, producing them or just advising. And um, it's time for me to, to step it up. And I'm very excited. It's time for you to roar. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Cecilia, we have some lovely questions in from our audience. So Joanna Lambert wants to know, where do you get your inspiration from? I could sum it up as observation, imagination and experience. Um, I think I'm someone who's always watching and listening and, and 
always wondering. <laughs> I always ask the question, what if, what if? So um, I think I bring in what I'm observing with my imagination. And then when I'm writing, I really have to pour my own heart and soul into it. So if I'm writing something that's sad, then I am crying my eyes out at the desk. It's really important to put how I feel into the stories as well. So they'd be the most the three important areas. Gorgeous. Steve Bishop wants to know if you could pick one of your stories to be made into a film that's not already been done, so very few left, which would it be? Um, well, there's two books that were optioned and then the option expired. So I would say Flawed and Perfect were my first uh, YA series. And um, I absolutely think they'd be amazing on screen, if I do say so myself. They're the real thriller-like feel and it's kind of um, a dystopian world where people are branded for being imperfect. So if people make moral or ethical um, mistakes, then they, they receive a brand and they have to live as second-class citizens, which I think uh, definitely reflects our society. So I'd love to see that on screen. It's just the production company is just going to have to speed up, Cecilia, and you're going to have to take control. That's the only thing for it. Um, have you always been interested in writing, wants uh, to know Sean McAdam? Always. Um, ever since I was a child, I've been writing I suppose as soon as you can learn. I wrote diaries every day, which I think was the most important thing for me because it was really about documenting my feelings and learning how to express how I feel, which is, has been so important for novels and understanding um, my character's emotions. I think my books are so emotion-led uh, that that was the best kind of research and training I ever could have done. But I never knew that I wanted to be a published author until I wrote P.S. I Love You. So that was... Um, it was a good beginning and it took me a while to get there. <laughs> I've just realised why you don't um, why you don't go deep into self-reflection because you effectively do your emotional laundry through your writing. <laughs> and that's it. It really is. I mean, I always think, like, what more can I give you? <laughs> I put myself through so much when I'm writing. Um, I honestly cry my eyes out and, and, and laugh if it's supposed to be funny, but I, it's like a method actor who kind of becomes that person when they're acting I really feel like that's what I do when I'm writing not just the main character but every character I have to see the world from all of their um situations all, all from their positions so it's quite exhausting but it's amazing it, it kind of helps you find a problem you know work through the problem and find a solution and it's so rewarding at the end of it Cecilia, um, congratulations on Freckles and on everything else and on your future wins, I have absolutely no doubt. It's been, once again, my absolute pleasure and I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Watch this space for the quietest and most contemplative world domination you've ever seen from Cecilia Hearn. Such a pleasure to have her with us. And that brings us so close to the end of today's event. It has been my honour and privilege to host once again IE Style Live 21. It just remains for me to hand you over to the woman who really made all of this possible. Features editor, Irish examiner, Vicky May. Thank you, Sonia. A reminder to everyone at home to pick up tomorrow's Irish examiner for your copy of IE Style magazine. It's your glossy guide to the season ahead. We have stunning shoots with the latest fashion and beauty trends, interviews, recipes, travel, and much more. You can buy the Irish Examiner in store or subscribe at irishexaminer.com. We're delighted to announce the winner of the luxury spa break for two, thanks to our great friends at the Montanotti Hotel. Congratulations to Noreen Scanlon. You are the lucky winner of this fantastic prize. And don't forget to keep an eye on the Irish Examiner's Twitter page later this evening, where we'll announce the winner of the €250 Euro voucher from Mahan Point Shopping Centre. So thanks to VE Studios, the amazing team at the Irish Examiner, Cecilia Hearn, our brilliant host, Sonia Lennon. Look, we know you all loved our IE Style live event at City Hall in 2019. We promise we'll be back next year with another of Anne-Marie's fabulous catwalk shows and with Brendan and Sonia as our hosts again. We'll see you next year. <laughs>